in my experience, there's not enough discussion on the front end of the case to inform that victim that when we get to the end of this road, there are going to be medical liens that need to get addressed. The ability to resolve those efficiently, effectively, is gonna be a great way to maximize the amount of money you're gonna be able to walk away with and have in your pocket when we're all said and done. I'm attorney Dave Craig, managing partner and one of the founders of the law firm of Craig, Kelly & Fallis. I've represented people who have been seriously injured or who have had a family member killed in a semi or other big truck wreck for over 30 years. Following the wreck, their lives are chaos. Often they don't even know enough about the process to ask the right questions. It is my goal to empower you by providing you with the information you need to protect yourself and your family. In each and every episode, I will interview top experts and professionals that are involved in truck wreck cases. This is After the Crash. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of After the Crash, the podcast. Today, I'm fortunate to have John Caddy Jr. Uh, he's a nationally known speaker, attorney, author, um, and uh, I'm excited to have him today because he's going to talk about something that not all clients understand or know about. And unfortunately, there's some lawyers who don't either. Uh, so we're going to dig, dig into it. Uh, but John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Dave. Such a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation to join you today. So I think one of the things that's always interesting to me is that when I sit down with a client, they're always focused on how much money are we going to settle for, right? How much money do we settle for? How much is the jury verdict going to be? And they're always focused on that number. And I always tell my clients that the real number that they should be focused on is how much money are they going to get to keep? And that isn't always reflective of how much money I get because we owe money out when we collect money. And I tell clients, there's two ways for me to get you money. One is to get you as much money from the other side as I possibly can. And two is to pay back people we owe as little as possible. And it, it, it seems to me that they miss that second part. And, and you're the perfect person to talk about this. So let's talk a little bit. Is, is that your experience as well? It is. It is, Dave. And, you know, it, putting myself in the shoes of an injury victim or the relative or friend of an injury victim, there's a few things that are going on, I think, um, in their minds um, during this. Number one is someone has been injured, someone that they care about, someone that they love, someone that they're close to, and, and perhaps that injury ha is catastrophic in nature, um, depending on the incident and the crash that was that occurred. So there, there's this sense of we really want to get justice. We want to get what we deserve at the end of the day from those that have done wrong and were negligent. And so that's going on in their heads. At the same time, there's this desire to want to be able to turn the page and start a new life and start a new life, hopefully, with adequate means and, you know, dare I say, in a financially better position perhaps than they were prior. And I think that so much focus from the injury victim's perspective is on what what's that final number going to look like. The final number in their mind is typically what I call that top line number. You know, what is going to be that ultimate offer from the insurance company that we're going to say yes to? Or what are we going to get when we go to trial and we really get to, to state our case and the jury sides with us 100%? The real number that injury victims ought to be caring about is what I call the bottom line number, which is the top line number, which is the ultimate amount of the settlement or the judgment in the injury victim's favor. But really, it's that number less any sort of offsets, any sort of expenses that need to be taken care of that have occurred and accumulated during the life of the case. And one of the biggest numbers typically or biggest issues that, to determine the difference between the top line number and the bottom line number, the number that ultimately is the money going to the injury victim, are healthcare liens. 
Absolutely. And the great thing, ladies and gentlemen, is John Law Firm is a law firm that is geared towards protecting that amount of money that folks get and to protect their rights and their benefits going forward and to minimize those health insurance liens or what other kind of liens there are. And his firm does that. Um, and not all law firms do that. A, a lot of personal injury law firms dabble in it. We might do some of it. But John's firm, that's what they do. And I guess out of curiosity, what got you into this area? So this company was building out this new business group, and they wanted someone with a legal background, with an entrepreneurial itch, uh, someone who wanted to take a little bit of risk to, to go out there and, and kind of make this their own and own it. So I started with that company um, in 2008, a company called Garrison Resolution Group. And for almost a decade, I was working with Garrison Resolution Group in the Medicare set-aside context, uh, not really having anything to do with healthcare liens, but the company becoming a pioneer in the healthcare lien resolution industry, both in the single event, single crash context, and in the mass tort context. Fast forward to 2016. I'm looking to make a change for a variety of reasons. And I look around the landscape of the country that uh, folks that are doing this Medicare set-aside work, lien resolution work, and I make this observation. There's a lot of personal injury attorneys that do this kind of work in their own firm. And, or they have a paralegal that's doing it, and they are on a one-off basis trying to handle the situation. There are companies that do this type of work and make it their business to do it. And these companies, sometimes, some of them, have licensed attorneys who are working for them, even though they're not practicing law. They can't give legal advice. Um, but they're doing this kind of work in a larger scale. But there were no law firms that were doing lien resolution work and preservation of future access to Medicare and Medicaid benefits. And for literally weeks, I was scratching my head trying to figure out why is there nobody who is doing this kind of work? It seems like when you're trying to resolve a healthcare lien that's based on federal law or state law, if you're trying to protect someone's future access to Medicare or Medicaid benefits, it would be beneficial to have attorneys doing that work who are able to give clients legal advice. That's something that I think would be appreciated, but why is nobody doing this? And I honestly could not come up with a good, valid reason as to the reason why. So in 2016, I stepped out and made a, made a big decision, went out there on a thin limb, so to speak, and I left Garrison, I opened up my own law firm, and since 2016, we have grown up. We started initially giving legal advice about Medicare set-asides. And over time, we began to develop and work and provide support and advice around healthcare liens, where here we are in fall of 2024. Uh, we have a national footprint doing this kind of work on behalf of injury victims and their personal injury attorneys, as well as workers' comp attorneys around the country. And we've got a team of about 20 folks who are who are doing this kind of work on behalf of our clients today. And and, and John, you you have a MBA and law degree, correct? So that, that's, that's right. That made you the perfect person as far as an entrepreneur that have an interest. Uh, you obviously have an interest in business as well. Well, Dave, funny thing about that. So I I went to law school at Villanova, started there in my first my first year. And about midway through the first semester, the opportunity presented itself for me to also be able to get my MBA at the same time. And so I said, you know what, I'm already studying really hard. I'm in law school. I don't have much life outside of, of school. And you can appreciate this. I was like, oh, why not? It will ex it'll extend my stay at Villanova for one more semester. I'll have dual master's degrees and I'll be I'll be ready to go. And so made that commitment to it, knowing that, you know, as a general rule, lawyers aren't necessarily known as the most astute of business people. So mm -hmm. I thought by getting that dual degree, I'll, I may have a leg up. Who knows what's coming in the future? But at least I'll I'll be as prepared as I possibly can. And, and I want to tell folks, because this this podcast is designed for ordinary people, uh, not, ne not, not necessarily lawyers, although we get lawyers that listen to it. Um, but I, you know, people don't necessarily know. I mean, I picked a niche, and and the niche that I picked um, was truck wrecks. 
uh, commercial motor vehicles. They're regulated by federal law, state law, local laws, industry standards. You have to know. You have to know that area. And and I I've had a lot of people on this podcast, uh, guests, experts, reconstructionists, defense lawyers, mediators, who will tell you that there's an advantage if you're in a truck wreck to pick someone who is niche, who's board certified, who, who knows that area of law. Because when you graduate from law school, they give you a diploma and they give you a JD and you can go practice any type of law you want to. But that doesn't mean you're good at every type of law. And as a lawyer, as somebody who does this, it's like a surgeon. If I was going to go get uh, cancer surgery or cancer treatment, I wouldn't get it from my general practitioner. If I had to have a colon surgery, I'd go to a surgeon, uh, internal medicine surgeon. I mean, so we know that in the medical side, you ought to pick people who are really good at that specific area. But ladies and gentlemen, the law is no different. And John has a niche that there's not many law firms, like he said, out there doing this niche. And have you found it rewarding that now that you've done it now for quite a few years? Has it been rewarding for you? It has been the greatest challenge and joy of my professional life, Dave. It is, uh, and you can speak to this as a business owner also, the ability to start something at the ground level that is yours and you are in control of, of the success of your venture. And it's based on your work, your effort, your smarts, um, the decisions that you make, and the emotion and care that you put into it. And so, you know, doing what I'm doing right now as the managing partner of Caddy and Gonzalez, it's the greatest joy and challenge at the same time of my professional career. Well, so, and folks, so that what we're talking to John about is that, so when you are involved in a personal injury case and it's a serious case and you have liens and met, your health insurance pays your bills uh, or Medicaid or Medicare or VA and, and your bills are getting paid, a lot of people don't even understand that very first principle. First thing is there's subrogation rights. The first thing is that you have to pay these people back. And I get asked all the time, well, why do I have to pay? I've been paying premiums or I've paid in the Social Security my entire life. Why in the world do I have to pay people back? But folks, you do. And if you don't take that part into consideration, you're missing a big part of the equation. So John, let's talk about, first of all, what kind of folks do we have to pay back? Yep. So. You know, generally speaking, Dave, folks who are providing medical care for injury victims during the life of their case, um, it can be existing on the federal level. It can be existing on the state level, the local level. It can be private health insurance. Uh, it can be as an extension of the military. Uh, it can be employers in the workers' compensation context. You know, a variety of folks are going to be in the position to pay an injury victim's medical expenses while their case is ongoing. And in my experience, there is there's not enough discussion on the front end of the case to inform that victim that when we get to the end of this road, there are going to be medical liens that need to get addressed. And medical liens, the ability to resolve those efficiently, effectively, is going to be a great way to maximize the amount of money you're going to be able to walk away with and have in your pocket when we're all said and done. And so working with these liens and trying to communicate and negotiate with lien holders is something that, like what you do in your niche of truck crashes, our niche here is healthcare lien resolution and preservation of benefits. And so being able to focus a practice on one particular area, as opposed to trying to address it all, allows you to drill really deep on that one area and, and establish a deep-rooted subject matter expertise and connections and network and knowledge of the system. How is How's the game getting played so that you can as quickly and efficiently as possible get to the best possible lien results in my case? And those liens, those folks that pay the medical bills, they're not all treated the same under the law. 
right? Some get some get preferential treatment. Some get, you know, they're entitled to 100% payback, or at least that's what they claim. No, that's right. And sometimes, Dave, those those lien holders who are saying that they're owed 100% back, um, you know, just because they say that doesn't necessarily make it so. And I see so many folks who are confounded by healthcare liens on a personal injury case, and they are hitting brick walls and frustrated by what they're getting back in terms of lack of willingness to negotiate and reduce. Um, and they tend to they tend to give up the fight too early. And that's a, that's a real problem. And part of that, Dave, stems from the timing of which when the lien is started to get worked. A lot of times we get to a position, I see it every day. I get calls, hey, John, I represent Jane Doe. Jane Doe was in a truck crash in North Carolina. And we just had mediation yesterday and we we got to a settlement. And I want to hire you guys to put Medicare and Medicaid on notice and negotiate those liens for us. And while I may take that case and provide assistance on it, the assistance that I'm going to be providing, and just like anybody else, is not nearly as substantial as if I was called a year earlier to say, hey, listen, I I represent Jane Doe, okay? Jane Doe was in a truck crash in North Carolina. Um, we have cases not settled yet. Mediation is not scheduled yet but she's enrolled in Medicare and Medicaid. And I know at the end of the day, we're going to have to resolve these leads. And so I want to get you to go ahead and get started with that now, because I know it's going to take time to get the best possible result. So allowing for more time to be able to work those leads effectively is a really great strategy and something injury victims need to be in their attorney's ears about on their case to make sure that while the attorney and the firm are are building the case up from a damages perspective to get to that best top line number. Things that are affecting, at the end of the day, the bottom line number need to also be getting worked in a similar, maybe parallel fashion. So that when we do get to mediation or get to trial and we're getting that result that that injury victim deserves, then the top line number is going to be as high as it can be. And the bottom line number is going to be as high as it can be. And I think folks that are listening is that, and again, that top line number. So let's say we're negotiating a case and we're negotiating a $6 million settlement. And so everybody's focused on that $6 million, And they're at five million nine hundred, And we're trying to get them to $6 million. And so we're fighting over that $100,000. And where they're losing sight of is they may owe 300000 in medical expenses, liens. And so they don't fight nearly as hard for 100,000 on the bottom as they fight for that 100,000 on the top. And the crazy thing is a lot of lawyers charge 37% to 40% on that top 100,000 that they're fighting over. And so a big chunk of that top number goes off in attorney fees. And the bottom number, you don't necessarily have as big of a hit all the time on that collecting that extra hundred thousand. So really, the client's better off to save a hundred in most cases than they are to get a hundred. Is that right? Very true. Very true, Dave. You know, there there's gonna be a bigger hit on that extra hundred on the top end than there's gonna be on the bottom end. And so I think clients need to, to focus on both and be talking to their attorneys. And, and that's true, folks, whether it's Medicaid, Medicare, whether it's VA, whether it's ERISA, what we call an ERISA plan, regular health insurance plan, all of these are complicated. They're, they're, they have certain contracts uh, that, you know, I know John is going to want to look at. He's going to look at the language. But this is things that you want to be working far ahead. And sometimes, I, don't, I at least I've seen in my practice, where bills where we get our clients get charged for bills that they don't even really owe that are they're not even right bills 
And I've been in mediation with other lawyers, sitting at a mediation with a group where I represent one person, they represent somebody else in the same rec, and I'm asking them questions about their liens, the attorney, and they have no idea. They just took the, the piece of paper or whatever the lien holder told them they owed, and that was the number they were using. Sometimes, the, I assume, health insurance companies, lien holders, they get it wrong, don't they? <laughs> Happens all the time, Dave. I, I can't tell you how many times where we are asked to assist with resolving a lien on a, on a particular case. And it doesn't matter whether it's Medicare or Medicaid or an ERISA plan or working with a veteran and they've got VA coverage or a TRICARE coverage or, or whatever the case may be. And you get that initial lien letter itemization back from, from the lien holder. And nine times out of 10, the itemization is going to be wrong because they're going to include charges, medical expenses that are not related to the case at all. Okay, so here's an example. All right. Let's say that I'm getting called up by that same attorney who represents Jane Doe in that truck crash in North Carolina. And he says, listen, Jane Doe's on Medicare and Medicaid. Can you help? And yeah, sure. So we we get the proper documentation in. We send that off to Medicare, and Medicare comes back and says, "Yep, we have paid two hundred forty-two thousand dollars worth of conditional payments of charges on behalf of Jane Doe." Well, guess what? Jane Doe's injuries um, had to do with lower body, lower extremity injuries, broken bones, and etc. But included with all these charges are cardiac heart charges that are not related to the truck crash. Well, the lien holder, in this example, Medicare, has included those. And if you're not careful, you're going to pay back a lien that is too big because you're paying on charges that the lien holder has no right to collect on. So it really is important to line by line be able to understand, yes, this charge is related. This charge is related to the case. This one's related to the case. Okay, no, the heart, anything related to the heart, that's not a part of our case. We admit there was no um there was no injuries to the heart or anything cardiac related as part of this case. So it's not appropriate to have to pay back a lien for anything that's related to the heart. And that's the granular type of work that needs to be done in order for that bottom line number to be as high as possible. Is there times where, so like if you wanna challenge a bill um, and you say, okay, this bill, this is not right. Is there sometimes, some, sometimes you're limited in the, in the amount of time you have to challenge that bill? Yeah, it depends on the circumstances, Dave. Depends on the circumstances. There's always an ability to challenge a bill and to dispute a lien itemization and ask the lien holder to remove certain items. Obviously, if you're getting around to um, addressing liens after you've settled your case, that becomes more challenging. Depending on the lien that it is, the fact that the case is settled may cement in place what that number looks like. Depending on the lien that we're talking about, there may be some opportunities to continue to dispute or to appeal those determinations. But that's why starting this lien work earlier on in the case is really advantageous for the injury victim. And they need to understand when they watch this podcast, they need to communicate with their attorney, not only about what their expectations are about that top line number, but hey, how are we gonna best handle the liens in my case to get those as low as possible, because that means my bottom line number is going to be as big as possible. And and would you agree with me? Just like in my world, um, not every lawyer should be handling a truck wreck case, um, and nor should I be handling a medical malpractice case. Um, you know, as my license would allow me to, but you don't want me to. Um, and uh, would you agree with me that not all lawyers are equal? in handling this bottom line area, the, the, the leads and the reductions and the, uh, the set-asides. So, Dave, it's funny. Um, I, I think the most valuable thing that anybody on this planet has is time. 
It's the one thing that we can't buy more of. We can't get back once it's already passed. I don't know anybody except in the movies who has built a time machine and been able to travel and and turn a 24-hour day into a 36-hour day. It's not that other attorneys can't do this kind of work. A general practitioner can certainly do it, but in order to do it at a level that someone who focuses their practice on it does it, takes literally hundreds of tens of thousands of hours in their career to get to such a level of expertise and experience to be able to know what arguments to make, when to make them, who to talk to so that a lien can be resolved in 10 days as opposed to 300 days. Because think about it from this perspective. The money, the dollar difference is important, but the time difference, there's also something to be said for that, okay? Because as an injury victim, you not only want to get your money, you not only want to turn the page on this chapter of your life and move forward, doing that as quickly as you can with as much money in your pocket as you can is the perfect scenario. Yeah. And so when a lien takes a long time to resolve, yeah, you might get to the proper result at the end of the day, but if you could have gotten to that same result in one-tenth of the time, that's a better result. Well, and, and I think that, you know, I think folks should look at it and say, I mean, the goal is, I mean, no one person is good at everything um, because it's just we don't have enough time to study and spend and learn all the all the all the less all the CI uh, all the seminars I go to, I either speak at, host, or watch or go to happen to be in my niche, um, and so and I think that you know my goal when I represent somebody is to put together the best team that can help this client make the best recovery. They got one shot. And I'm dealing with catastrophically injured folks or wrongful death cases. They've got one shot and they deserve the best team. And if that means that there happens to be like an underwrite issue, and I don't know underwrite as well as some other lawyer in the country, then I reach out to that underwrite lawyer and say, hey, can you help me with part of my case? And if it's on lien reductions and preserving assets, uh, and then why not put that person on the team that does this day in and day out, 24-7. Um, and so I think when you are a client, you should be looking for a lawyer who wants to put together the best team. Dave, what's the injury victim's goal after they've been catastrophically hurt? Being able, being able to get the best possible result you can. And as attorneys who represent those injury victims on the truck crash case, or on whatever type of personal injury case there is, one needs to sometimes swallow their pride and understand and, and respect that ultimate goal of best possible result for the client. Absolutely. And sometimes that means that you might not be best equipped to handle a certain aspect of your case. To your point, if, there is a, if there's a blind spot in the team that you have assembled, you want to partner up with co-counsel with someone who can fill that goal, complete that blind spot, right? Liens are one of those areas that all the time is a blind spot for most. Because most attorneys who work with injury victims, they can struggle through a lien or they've got someone in the office who they think is pretty good and they devote their time to it. Um, and they might be pretty good on a certain lien, but maybe not as good at other liens, right? Whereas someone who is a specialist, who focuses their practice on the area, day in and day out, doing this literally hundreds of times a week on a variety of cases, fact patterns, and lien holders, working with, negotiating with, going through that process from start to finish. There's an advantage to working with someone who, who is niche and boutique in the world that they work in and really have that experience and expertise in that world. Well, and I think that, and it can be extraordinarily, it's not only important from a financial standpoint, okay, 
we want to maximize the amount of money that our clients get. But there's another part of this that scares the death out of me. And that should scare every attorney, which is whatever you do, you don't want to jeopardize somebody's future benefits. Because if you mess up and somebody loses their Medicaid, Medicaid and they have to have it, and now they don't have it, and you've messed that up by giving them a settlement, they may have been happy as heck when they got that number, that top number, but when they went to go get their treatment, medical treatment, they couldn't they couldn't get it paid for, or Medicare, if they Medicare doesn't pay something, or a Jeopardy, I mean, those are really, and a lot of folks are on certain types of benefits, and they may lose those, and that is another benefit of working with a firm like yours, is you help preserve those benefits. Talk a little bit about that. It, it's a really sad situation when that comes to pass because for as little knowledge as an injury victim has about health care liens at the start of their case when, they're, when they are meeting with their attorney for the first time, um, as little attention as health care liens get, even less attention is given to the conversation that should go like this. David, listen, it's a pleasure to to work with you. I'm honored that you decided to allow me to represent you in your case. Uh, I'm really looking forward to assisting. Uh, to just want to cover a couple things. I know we've talked a little bit, but there was one thing that that was not covered, and and that's this. Is that is as we move forward, and hopefully we're going to get the best result for you that we possibly can. I know that you know down the road you're not on Medicare yet, but you are you may be getting on Medicare in the future. It, there's a possibility that if we don't take certain steps in your case on your behalf, that if we get a good result here, that your at future access to Medicare might be jeopardized. I wanted to make sure you understood that and you're gonna authorize me to take the steps that I need to take in order to protect your future access to Medicare as part of the representation that I'm providing to you. How's that sound? And I mean, that conversation doesn't happen that often. No, it doesn't. And, and the same conversation needs to happen when the individual is on state Medicaid benefits, <laughs> right? Which is even more acute because there's a difference between Medicare and Medicaid. Those are two separate and distinct insurance programs. And sometimes those get confused by people all the time, even attorneys. Um, and so the potential is there when you achieve a settlement or a judgment in a case that unless certain steps have already been taken, that an injury victim could lose access to future Medicare and Medicaid. And I think walking in the door, meeting with the attorney, that's one of the things that for sure is not on their radar screen. And it shouldn't be. They shouldn't come in the door with the knowledge of that. That's on the attorney to advise them of that potential, and then ask them if they want to make sure that those benefits are going to be protected, yes or no. Now, sometimes the injury victim client's not going to care about that for whatever reason. And, but most of the time, when it's presented to them in that kind of way, yes, obviously I don't want anything to be done to jeopardize my potential future access to Medicare and Medicaid benefits down the road. So please, Make sure that you are taking the proper steps to protect those for me as we go on in my case and as we move it towards uh, settlement. At the very least, I believe people need to have the information. I mean, I, I represent the clients as clients make decisions all the time. Clients make a decision whether to settle. Clients make a decision with me whether to go to trial. But they, unfortunately, if they don't have the information, they can't be expected to make the right decision. And I get clients that don't understand the difference. They may be on SSI um, <laughs> and when they think they're on S SSD. They don't know that is, there's there's a difference. And they come to me and say, oh, what do you mean? I might lose my benefits. Um, you know. And so I think that's a really good point is that on the front end, because most people, again, when they come in, their life is turned upside down. It's chaos. And they're focused on who's responsible and how are they going to pay me? They are not thinking anything at all about future medical, future health insurance, future benefits. 
And uh, and I think having that conversation and and providing that information to people would be very extraordinarily extraordinarily helpful. And Dave, attorneys should not expect injury victims to be thinking in that kind of way. That that's unfair and inappropriate for them to assume that they understand that on the front end. It it's incumbent on the attorney who is representing that individual to have that conversation on the front end of the case. I recently had a case where a client went to, a, it was a policy limits case. And so, you know, it, 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 there was hundreds of thousands of dollars involved and it was going to be a sure limits case. And the person had a lawyer. They went to this lawyer and the lawyer is a known trial lawyer, uh, goes to this known trial lawyer and a lawyer says, well, I can, I can probably get you limits. Um, but, um, and the person said, well, what about my benefits? And they had income sensitive benefits. And the lawyer said, well, it could mess those up. And they said, well, what do you mean? They said, well, I don't do that. I'm just going to go get you the money and I'm going to give it to you. And those, then you figure that out. And this client is like, well, I don't know how to figure that out. And so the lawyer called my office. He said, he goes, well, you either, I either just get you the money and give it to you, or you find yourself another lawyer. So the person called me. So I actually called the lawyer and said, hey, look, we can help you walk through this process. There's no reason for you to not take, the guy's like, I don't have any interest in it. I don't even, <laughs> like, this lawyer didn't even want to know. Oh, he, he would rather not help the client, not get a fee. And so we, you know, we put in place and protected the client's assets. But it's just like, you know, there's, if the client had done that, if the lawyer had just collected the money and gave it to the client, the client would have immediately lost some of their benefits. And Absolutely true. And, 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 and some of these folks cannot afford to lose their benefits. They have they have needs that are monthly and they have health insurance needs that are on their own Medicaid and they cannot afford to lose that coverage. And and the sad thing is working with the right people like yourself, there are ways around that. You don't have to lose your benefits. Whether whether the individual realizes it or not, or whether you and I realize it or not, we we tend, I think, to take our health care insurance for granted in certain ways we just assume that it's there and we don't we don't give enough thought to what needs to be done to make sure that our access to that remains uninterrupted or proceeds in the way that we want it to proceed because there will be some situations where someone is on medicaid or income sensitive benefits that are that may end up resolving a truck cash crash case for six million dollars and the tools that may be utilized to preserve that future access to medicaid might not be a great fit for what the goals of that individual are they might be too restrictive and they might say i don't care about preserving my future access to medicaid benefits I'm okay giving those up. I'll I will proceed in a different way um, because of the result that you're getting for me. But you know what? That's a conversation that needs to be had. It should never be assumed. And just for any attorneys out there who are watching this podcast, don't feel as though you can't accept a case and provide assistance to an injury victim simply because of a lien issue. You know, about 10 years ago, there was a lot of back and forth. Um, in my world about wh whether Medicare was going to do this, that, or the other. And it really caused a fuss with some attorneys who ended up saying, you know what? Uh, this stuff is so uncertain. I'm just not going to take on any cases involving Medicare beneficiaries because I don't want to, I don't want to run the risk of anything. And I think what we're here saying is that, you know what, that there are conversations that should be had between the injury victim client and their attorney to be clear about how to proceed, not only on the lien side of things, but also on the 
benefit preservation side of things so that there is clarity with how things are going to roll out. And you know, if the client does not want certain things to happen, well, that's the client's prerogative. But the attorney should never assume that something should be done or should not be done. They ought to always understand that there needs to be some due diligence and conversations had to be clear about what should happen. Well, I, I, I'd like to give some people some guidance. So, um, you know, and, I, and I've done this on some other podcasts and it's always funny because I've actually had clients walk in and ask me these questions uh, and say, well, you think, you know, that you should be asked this. So let me ask you. And, uh, and I love it because I loved, I mean, you know, information is power. Uh, it gives people the power to make the right decisions. You, if, you're, if you're in a catastrophic accident where you've had lost a loved one, you shouldn't feel forced. You shouldn't feel coerced into picking a lawyer. You should take your time and interview and make sure you're picking the right person. And one of the and I'd like to give them guidance on how to go about doing that. So so John, if you were advising somebody that was looking for a lawyer, um, what questions would you have them ask their lawyer to to kind of figure out whether or not their liens are going to be reduced and, and taken care of properly and whether or not they're going to their their benefits are going to be preserved. Yes, Dave, great question. So some of the questions that immediately pop to my mind are, how does your office handle health care liens? Do you have attorneys in-house who are doing that? Are you going to do that for me personally? Or is your paralegal going to do that? Um, do you guys, do you outsource that to somebody else? It's, who else is doing that for you? If it's not you or someone within your firm who's doing that for me, then... Who else is doing it? Are they attorneys doing it? Or are they non-attorneys that are doing that kind of work? How long have you, if you do outsource that work, how long have you worked with them? What has been your experience? Um, what's been their success rate? I'm on Medicare. So what's been their success rate in resolving a Medicare lien? Um, questions like that to get a real sense and understanding about the process of it internally at the firm and their the way they handle it because the response to those questions is going to tell the injured victim a whole lot about how much that attorney cares about that bottom line number. Why well, and I think those are great questions and I hopefully people will you know they'll start walking in and asking me those questions and and, and anybody else that they're considering hiring. Um, one of the things questions clients are always concerned about is fees. Um, and you know how do how am I going to afford to pay this? Um, and a lot of unfortunately, a lot of folks in mean, the, the trucking industry and in the insurance industry, especially in the trucking world, they can afford to hire the best attorneys. I mean, there's attorneys that do nothing but transportation law, um, and and I, I'm against the same ones all over the country. And there are they have great experts. They can hire the best experts that do trucking investigations reconstruction, download. And so the trucking industry, especially in that area, they they can spend the money to do it right. Our clients typically don't have that kind of money. So they can't afford to pay an hour an hourly rate that the same defense lawyers would charge. And the great thing about me and, and other lawyers who do this work is we work on a contingency fee. We never make people pay us up front any money. They don't have to come in their pockets to get the best reconstructionist. I hire and put together a team of the best people uh, for each type of case. And, and so how so people might be listening to this and like I, oh my God, do I have to pay two lawyers or two law firms? How does that I mean, do I have to put money out to, to talk to you up front about my benefits? So talk a little bit about how how you typically work with other law firms. Yeah, absolutely. So we, very similar to yourself and your firm and other personal injury attorneys, the majority of the lean work that we do, we also do on a contingent fee basis, okay? Based on, we don't bill by the hour for most of the work that we do. Um, the results speak for themselves. If we're able to get a result, then our fee is a piece of the savings that we're able to achieve. If we're not able to get a result, which happens sometimes, I'll put that out there. Not every case is a winning case. Um, we all have 
cases that are challenging and we're not able to get a result. On those cases, we don't take a fee. Um, no, nothing up front for for someone to talk to us. Uh, we start don't start the clock, so to speak. Um, happy to consult with anybody initially to determine, hey, is there is there a way that we can help? And if there is, then here's how we're going to get started. And this is this is what the billing is going to look like. And if you guys are in agreement with that, then um, provide us with this information. We'll open our file and we'll get to work. And we'll, we will invoice you at the end of the case when our work is completed. So it's very similar. So people don't have to be scared or afraid um, to to reach out and, and have their lawyers work with someone else like yourself because they don't get paid till the end. And then it's just like I talked about before, you know, if you get $100,000 at the top and you take out fees, but you don't, you pay that 100000 on the bottom without negotiating, then you're losing. And so you want somebody negotiating that bottom numbers, uh, those liens, making sure that they're reduced, that you're only paying what you owe and that you're paying the le the, the, le the least amount that you legally ob are obligated to pay. Dave, here's an example. Uh, and I'll I'll choose we'll do Medicare. We've been talking about Medicare a little bit. Let me let me choose Medicare here as an example. So you 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 speak to working on that bottom number to try to bring that up. And I you know, it it's commonly understood that Medicare is willing to reduce to account for the um, efforts of the personal injury attorney representing the truck crash victim, right? Um, so that so there is something that's coming as an offset there. Typically, it's between a third and maybe forty percent off the top, and and a lot of a lot of attorneys seem to be okay with that as the the reduction, and they don't push any further. Um, thinking that their job is done, they're checking a the box, the lien's done, and now we can go ahead and disperse and the clients can be happy because we're get, getting the money dispersed. But, you know, my firm has an average Medicare lien reduction of 84% in the personal injury context, meaning that if the Medicare lien is starting out at $100,000, we are typically on average getting it down to a final number that has to get paid back to Medicare totaling $16,000. That's real money to that truck crash victim at the end of the day, making that bottom line number even higher. And again, it's not to say that the attorneys who are representing the truck crash victims can't get that type of result, but it is a matter of how much time you have an experience that you have and what's going into it and knowing how exactly to do it to be able to get those types of results. Yeah. And I would say the same thing's true. I mean, you have you develop relationships with different companies as well. Um, you do it day in and day out. You earn respect uh, from people because they know you know the area. And so certainly uh, you're capable of negotiating and handling a semi rec case. But I would tell you, Maybe you want me to do it for you uh, because of the fact that I have the respect. I try these cases. I, I deal with these issues. I deal with all the I know this area. But the same goes true with you. And I think that's what people need to realize is that, you know, there's very rarely one person that just does it all. And I love that. I love that, you know, being actually able to know here's the reduction our company gets. How are you guys doing? <laughs> you know, top, I'm happy to take my results and my my niche up against anybody's, but I like working with people who are willing to take their results uh, and say, hey, look, I'm willing to compare mine to anybody. And that's another great question. I ask people, how successful are you? How, how successful are you reducing these liens? Yeah, I, I, I will put our numbers up against anybody in the country doing it, whether you're a law firm, that does this kind of work, whether you're a company that does this kind of work or any any personal injury firm that represents the injury victim on the underlying personal injury claim. I'm so proud of the numbers and the results that we get and the team that we have doing it. Um, you know, I, I shared with you, Medicare, we average 84% reductions. Um, for, for those folks who are not on traditional Medicare, but 
may have a Medicare Advantage plan like from Humana or United Healthcare or Aetna or something like that that they purchased. Um, in fact, as we're doing this today, the open enrollment period is starting. So many folks uh, that may be watching this may be considering moving off of traditional Medicare and buying into a Medicare Advantage plan. Well, we have an average lien reduction there of 73%. And that's not on one case. That's on an average of every single case that our firm has worked in our firm's history. Um, for state Medicaid cases across the board, it's average of 63% reductions. ERISA liens for employer-based health care plans, we average 64% reductions. And then when it comes to military liens for veterans and family members, um, with the Veterans Administration, the VA, we average 94% reductions. Mm -hmm. And for TRICARE, we average 87%. So I will put those up against anybody in the country. And I'm very competitive about it, Dave. Uh, so if there's an area that we're dragging compared to anybody else that this is kind of work, uh, understand that I will be redoubling efforts internally to, to push that and get that number where it needs to be. Well, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I mean, every case is different. Um, and, you know, but the great thing about it is if you've done enough of this, uh, whatever your niche is and you're good at it, um, you should be willing to discuss your results. And I tell people that I, mean, I, I, when they, I when they should interview lawyers and, and whether it's a personal injury lawyer, you should ask them, what are your results? Have you handled a case similar to mine? Have you taken a case to trial? It's amazing to me. There's a lot of lawyers out there that are trial lawyers that have never taken a case to trial nor had their firm. And there is a difference. And so you should ask those questions and you should ask specifics on liens and how do you do it? How well are you? Doing? And I think that by doing that, you're looking out for you. Usually there's somebody in the family who's looking out for them. And if you're that person, then go with your family and ask those tough questions. Because this is, when you're buying a house, you rely on a real, I mean, this is the biggest decision you're going to make, is what team am I putting together to protect my family? And I don't care if it's me and John, but by God, it should be somebody who knows and can answer those questions and can handle and protect your family. It's such an important decision to be made, right? You know, and it's one that should not be done off the hip. It shouldn't be feel rushed or forced or um, quick to come, right? It's something that needs to be considered and with real thought. And there needs to be a level of comfort. And so injury victims should, I think, not only ask about results, in other similar cases, but do you have any testimonials from anybody? What has been the experience? I want to hear from other people how they have felt about working with you in the past. What have they said about that experience? Because the results are one thing, but the client experience to me is even more important than the results at the end of the day, okay? Because if one is treating someone with well, with care and dignity, it's gonna be returned and it's gonna be as enjoyable of an experience as it possibly can. Yeah. Um, whether we are talking about a truck crash case and you're doing the work that you do with, with some of the most severely catastrophically injured people uh, in those cases, or whether we're talking about having to go back and forth with a, an ERISA plan saying that they're self-funded and they're not gonna reduce a lien or anything like that, right? It's all, the client experience to me is more important than the results. But when you focus on the client experience, in my experience, the results come naturally. No, I, and I agree with you. And I, I, I had recently, uh, it was a really tragic truck wreck case. The, somebody that was making the decisions for the family called me and said they had narrowed it down. They had done their homework. They had narrowed it down to three law, lawyers. And um, they said, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out which of the three. And I said, well, that's, I think, first of all, it's fantastic that you've done some research. It's fantastic that you're interviewing us. And they go, do you want to know who the others are? And I said, no. I said, I don't need to know who they are. I said, what questions can I answer for you? Um, and so they, they asked me questions. And they said, at the end, they said, well, why should we pick you? And I said, well, I tell you what, if you pick me, I will be very appreciative of the fact that I get to work for you and your family. 
when you interview these other two lawyers, ask, come out, do you feel the same way? Or do they make you feel like you should be fortunate? You're fortunate to pick them. I go, it's a very subtle difference. You know, whether you whether they believe that you're fortunate to have picked them or they're fortunate to have the chance to work for you. And I believe honestly that I I I, I love working for people. I I my son's a lawyer here, my daughter's a lawyer, my wife's involved in my practice. I get up every morning, I'm excited about it. I have pictures on my desk of the people who I'm working for. And um, you know, it, it never gets old. And so I do think you're absolutely right. The client experience and these kind of cases, you're spending sometimes a few years with somebody. And it has to be people who who you believe care, who are going to take your phone calls, who are going to meet with you, who are going to, you know, talk to you in the in in the in the evenings and the weekends. At least that's important to me. Uh, and so I think you really need that. And you need somebody who says, okay, I need this expert. Uh, maybe I need a lawyer to help me here. I need a lawyer to help me there. That its ego is not so big, or hers or his is not so big, that they feel like they can do everything, because it's getting harder and harder to do everything. One can do everything, Dave, but they can't do it well, nearly as well as as someone who recognizes the weaknesses or blind spots that they have, and and they look to the outside to bolster those, because they understand that. It's all about getting the best possible result for the client. Yep, absolutely. Well, John, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being a guest on our after the uh, the, the, the crash podcast. How do people get a hold of you if there's lawyers listening to this or clients who uh, that uh, are concerned about these matters? How does somebody get a hold of you? Absolutely, Dave. Our our firm's website. We are we're Chatting Gonzalez. The firm website address is www.caddylaw. Dot com that's c a t t i e l a w dot com um, for folks that want to send me a, a personal email uh, my email address is j caddy c a t t i e at caddylaw dot com um, and always happy to jump on a call talk with anybody um, about these issues and try to point people in the right direction if we at the end of the day can assist to what we're here to do. This is David Craig, and you've been listening to After the Crash. If you'd like more information about me or my law firm, please go to our website, ckflaw.com. Or if you'd like to talk to me, you can call 1-800-ASK-DAVID. If you would like a guide on what to do after a truck wreck, then pick up my book, Semi-Truck Wreck, A Guide for Victims and Their Families, which is available on Amazon, or you can download it for free on our website, ckflaw.com.